Hello everybody, this is Dr Christopher White and in this presentation we're going to begin thinking about earthquakes and the Earth's interior. So in this video we're going to begin by thinking about what is an earthquake and this is going to correspond to section 12.1 of your textbook. So at its most basic level an earthquake is simply a release of energy. Now there are lots of ways in which energy can be released in large quantities through geologic processes but of course the most common cause of earthquakes is going to be fault movement. So if we look on our slide here we can see we have a situation where we have two blocks of rock that are trying to move past each other so we have a strike slip fault. This block of rock here is trying to move towards the bottom right and this block of rock here is trying to move towards the top left. Now we know that these blocks of rocks want to move past each other because there are tectonic forces which are pushing them. They're, they are physically trying to be moved by some kind of geologic process. However, the problem is, is that at the contact between these two blocks, which is the fault plane, there's obviously going to be friction because it's not a smooth surface, it's a very rough surface. And so it's very difficult for these blocks of rock to move past each other. So what's going to happen is, is over time energy is going to build up in these two blocks of rock. Now eventually the amount of energy is going to get so high, or should I say the amount of strain is going to get so high that it will be sufficient to overcome the friction. And once friction is overcome, these two blocks of rock will begin to move past each other. Now, this, uh, this movement and the release of energy that it produces leads to mechanical energy being released and we feel this mechanical energy in the form of seismic waves. So these are pressure waves that move through the earth from where the earthquake begins. And these waves will typically spread out from the, the, the point where the earthquake starts and they'll spread out in all directions. And of course we feel these earthquakes on there, uh, feel these waves on the surface of the earth in the form of earthquakes because they make the ground go up and down, they make the ground move from side to side. Now, in terms of the location where the earthquake itself actually occurs, that's going to happen at a location called the hypercenter. Now, directly above the hypercenter on the surface of the earth is a term that I'm sure you're familiar with, which is the epicenter. So the epicenter actually isn't where the earthquake occurs. It's actually the point on the earth's surface directly above the location where the earthquake occurs. So the actual location where the earthquake occurs is the hypercenter right there. Now, obviously, once the earthquake, um, once the earthquake uh, occurs, we have energy which has been stored up in these two blocks of rock being released, and it's released as mechanical energy, and it causes the ground to vibrate. And these are, of course, these vibrations are, of course, the result of seismic waves. And these seismic waves are going to emanate out in all directions from the hypercenter. So they're going to come upwards, downwards, and they're going to go to the sides as well. Now, in terms of detecting our earthquakes, the Earth's surface is covered in seismic stations. So nearly every government on the planet will have its own geologic survey or its own uh, surveying uh, department of some kind. And one of their jobs will be to set up and monitor seismic stations to detect earthquake activity. So obviously we can see if this is our hypercenter here, we have two seismic stations, one and two, and you can probably work out pretty quickly that uh, when you know the earthquake actually begins to occur, seismic waves are going to start moving out from the hypercenter, and obviously station one is going to de is going to detect them before station two. So typically, the further you are away from the earthquake the longer it will take the seismic waves to arrive. And just to be clear, when we have a, a decent sized earthquake occurring, it can be detected by seismic stations on the other side of the planet. So these seismic waves can go all the way through the Earth's interior to be detected. So just bear that in mind, you know, these waves will travel over very, very large distances. Now, what causes most earthquakes? Well, the vast majority of earthquakes are the result of fault movement. Now, in the case of faults, obviously, we have a situation where we have two blocks of rock that want to move past each other. But as I mentioned, that's very, very difficult because the fault plane where they're in contact is naturally going to be very rough. That means these pieces of rock will not move past each other easily because there's lots of friction. And so this friction is going to stop the pieces of rock moving past each other. And so we're going to get strain building up 
in the blocks either side of the fault plane. So remember, there's geologic processes, there's tension, there's compression, and there's shearing. This, these stresses are imparting energy into these blocks of rock. They're trying to make them move, but they can't because of the friction. So what's going to happen is eventually the stored up energy, the strain, is going to become so high that it will overcome friction and the two blocks of rock will start moving past each other. And of course, once they start moving, this is when we get the release of energy. That energy gets turned into mechanical energy, which of course we call seismic waves and we feel those as the earthquake. Now, in terms of our three types of faults, obviously we have normal faults, reverse and thrust faults and strike slip faults. And obviously they're going to occur uh, in slightly different uh, locations. So we know that normal faults are due to tension. So that the crust is being stretched, it's being extended. So we know that these types of faults are most likely to be associated with divergent plate boundaries. So we'll tend to get uh, earthquakes associated with normal faults at divergent plate boundaries. This can be oceanic divergent plate boundaries or continental divergent plate boundaries. In the case of reverse and thrust faults, of course, we know they're, they're the result of compressive tectonics, so we're most likely to find these kinds of faults occurring at convergent plate boundaries. And in the case of strike-slip faults, we know that they are the result of shearing, so we're most likely to find this type of fault um, at transform plate boundaries. So are there any other locations, any other geologic processes that can produce earthquakes? Well, the answer is yes, there's lots of them. So nearly any kind of release of energy through geologic processes can produce seismic waves, which obviously we can detect. Now, one of the other classic sources of earthquakes is volcanic activity. So how can volcanoes generate seismic waves? Well, the most straightforward option is simply an explosive volcanic eruption. So in the case of a, a Plinian eruption, like we can see here, we know that the, uh, the eruption itself is going to begin typically with an explosive event, which is going to damage the top of the volcano. This is obviously also going to impart a lot of energy into the surrounding rocks because of the explosion. And so the, the, the energy, the waves of energy, the mechanical energy is going to move through the surrounding rocks and we're going to feel that as an earthquake. We're going to feel the ground shake. Obviously, we know that a lot of volcanic activity is associated with areas that are heavily faulted. So we know we get lots of volcanoes at divergent plate boundaries and we get volcanoes at convergent plate boundaries as well. And we know both of these environments are very heavily faulted. So it's not uncommon for volcanoes to be situated near large faults and processes that can, that can be occurring around the volcano can also cause faults nearby to move. So if you imagine we have this magma chamber here, it's starting to fill up with magma, so it's getting larger and larger and larger. Well, that's obviously going to impart stresses onto the surrounding rock because this magma chamber is expanding. And obviously this expansion of the magma chamber can impart strain onto the fault plane here. And if enough strain is provided, it can cause the fault to move and obviously that will produce an earthquake. Slope failure is, of course, another classic example of a process that can lead to uh, earthquake generation. So by slope failure, what we really mean is landslides. And of course, this is very, very common in volcanoes that have you know, steep sides and often uh, volcanic rocks which are dominated by ash and dust, so pyroclastic material. So you're most likely to get this happening at um, either composite or dome volcanoes. Now, obviously, slope failure is simply due to uh, the, uh, the material becoming unstable and it slides downhill under gravity. But once again, this movement of this material down the slope of the volcano is going to produce lots and lots of mechanical energy. This is going to be imparted into the surrounding rocks in the form of seismic waves. And once again, we're going to feel that uh, as ground motion. We're going to feel the ground shake. And so once again, this is another type of earthquake. Now, the final type of earthquake, and arguably the, uh, the second most common cause of earthquakes, is magma movement. So obviously, in order for magma to make its way to the surface, it has to make its way through the rock. So how does it do that? Well, we know that most pieces of rock are, on the whole, pushed pretty tightly against each other. There's not much space for the magma to actually move through. So in order for magma to actually exploit some kind of weakness like a joint or a fault, the magma itself has to have enough pressure to force 
that joint open to make room for itself. And obviously this process of forcing the joint or the fault open is going to once again release mechanical energy, which gets imparted into the surrounding rocks. We'll detect that as, well, we'll detect that as seismic waves, otherwise known as an earthquake. So there's lots of magma moving in the Earth's crust, and so there are all so there's going to be lots and lots of earthquakes associated with magma movement. And of course, where do we get the vast majority of magma being located? We find it along divergent and convergent plate boundaries. So this, to some degree, helps to explain why plate boundaries are such hotspots for volcanic activity, because obviously you have the uh, large amounts of faults along both convergent, divergent and transform plate boundaries. And also at convergent and divergent plate boundaries, you also have lots of volcanic activity and associated magma movement. So you can really begin to see why you get so many volcanoes along plate boundaries. Now, are there any other things which can cause um, earthquakes? Well, yes, we've already touched on landslides. Now, in terms of landslides themselves, we tend to think about landslides that occur on land. However, there can also be extremely large landslides which occur underwater. So if you remember, um, when you go off the coast of the continent, there's an area of relatively shallow water which we call the continental shelf. The water is normally about zero to 200 meters deep. Now, as you get to the edge of the continental shelf, you go past something called the shelf break, and then you move down the continental slope. And the continental slope is often quite steep, anywhere between about 70 to 90 degrees. And so if you get material that starts falling down this continental slope underwater, it's obviously going to move down this slope with a lot of energy because it's a very steep slope in most cases. And so the movement of this material down the continental slope can be sufficient to produce noticeable earthquake activity. And some of the landslides that have occurred um, on continental shelves, uh, on continental slopes, sorry, have been absolutely huge and they have produced a very substantial earthquake in as you know as part of that process the final cause uh, of seismic waves is actually a human cause and it's explosions most accurately nuclear explosions so if we look here we can see we have a couple of seismograms on the top here we have one for a nuclear test and on the bottom here we have one for an earthquake and you can see the nuclear test is producing seismic waves just like the earthquake so it's very common for governments to actually uh, have seismic stations set up to try and detect nuclear explosions. So let's say, for instance, North Korea is trying to test a nuclear weapon. There will be seismic stations set up in the surrounding uh, countries and they will try and detect the seismic waves produced by that nuclear explosion. And very often the first warning we have that a nuclear explosion has, been, has gone off is through the presence of these uh, seismograms. We, you know, we see the seismic waves arriving, we realize there's something has happened. And typically, uh, when you build nuclear facilities to do things like nuclear bomb testing, you build them underground. And so you'll very often try and build them in the most geologically stable area possible, because you don't want your nuclear test facility to have a big fault running through the middle of it, because that's just going to lead to trouble. So one of the right ways which we can you know, discern what's a nuclear test compared to an earthquake is simply by looking at where the seismic waves emanated from. And if we know they're emanating from an area of the Earth's surface which should typically be relatively stable, so there should be little to no earthquake activity there, you can say, right, well, this was a very large release of energy which happened very, very quickly. There's no logical reason, you know, no logical geologic reason that that should have happened. And so the most likely explanation is someone's tested a nuclear weapon. And obviously the, uh, the, the, the size of seismic waves released, or should I say the amount of energy released by the nuclear explosion also gives governments an idea of how big the bomb being tested actually was. So, you know, there's other non-geological information which, uh, seismic, which seismograms can also give us. All right. Thank you for watching, everybody, and have a good day.